back in the 90s, there was this really popular channel called MTV. Short for Music Television. As you might be able to assume, the channel was popular for airing everything music. Whether it be new music videos, live concerts, behind the scenes of your favorite artists and bands, more music videos, it was a really solid channel to just have on at all times and for most situations. You got company coming over? Let MTV run in the background. Got a girl or boy coming to your house? MTV. It was one of the most simple yet widely successful and beloved channels to ever exist. But one day MTV had one of the ideas of all time. What if they took the M out of MTV? Making it... just television. Yeah, the network was seeing massive success in viewerships from teenage to young adults as their primary viewers. So, I guess to give them some variety, MTV throughout the years would start to add non-music related programming to their time slots. Nightcrawler! <laughs> Cartoons meant to appeal to the teenage slash young adult demographic. Which is a nice way of saying, STUPID DUMB CARTOONS. But in a good way. Sometimes. Unlike Adult Swim or other cartoons that a little waffle like myself shouldn't have been watching at the time, these MTV cartoons weren't relegated to just being played at night. I remember turning on MTV at like 9am one morning and seeing these claymation characters violently dismember each other. So, I hope you can join me today as we go through the bizarre world of MTV cartoons. Everything from the beloved, the forgotten, and the accursed. Let's talk about something important. Your future. And if you're like me and love video games, then today's sponsor, Southern New Hampshire University, might just be able to help with that. Finding a career you love can be really difficult. I personally have worked many, many, many jobs that I didn't love to put it nicely. Maybe that's you too. Or maybe you're just graduating high school and don't know what your next steps in life are gonna look like. Whatever the reason, SNHU's online game development program gives you the knowledge and experience to create your own video games and help turn it into an actual career with opportunities for growth. Yeah, if you love video games, why not turn that into a career? SNHU is an accredited nonprofit program and has radically affordable tuition. You'll learn everything on how to bring your characters and environments to life with 2D and 3D modeling, texturing, and game physics, as well as the three major computer programming languages, C++, C Sharp, and Java the pillars to any great game. What's great is that your courses are taught by faculty with real-world experience, so you'll have opportunities to connect with people in the industry. And as you graduate, SNHU will still be there to offer assistance for your job hunt. So if a career in the gaming industry is something you're interested in, then definitely check out snhu.edu slash connorthewaffle, or click that link in the description to see if you qualify for SNHU's game development program. You might be eligible for financial aid, or have previous college credits that could fast track your degree at SNHU. So click that link to get started to turn your dream game and your dream job into a reality. Thanks again to SNHU for sponsoring, let's get back to the video. Alright, well dang, that's one way to start this. Beavis and Butthead. The first ever MTV cartoon to be created debuted on March 8th, 1993, following two dumb best friends named Beavis and Butthead respectively. Uh, uh. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nachos. <laughs> <laughs> They're two dumb teenagers who live in Texas and, well that's pretty much the show. It's a slice of life watching the day-to-day -day misadventures of two complete idiots. Are good. Everything from the dumb conversations they have to the ridiculous situations they get into because it sounds cool. One quarter pound world burger with cheese. <laughs> cool. Beavis and Butthead have such a lovable charm to them. You know, if you were young. Despite being complete numbskulls who annoy everyone around them, they never manage to annoy the viewer. Again, if you were young. These guys think they're funny, but they're really just, like, stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, when you think you're pregnant, but you really just have to take a big dump. <laughs> yeah. I think that's because Beavis and Butthead are just so simple-minded. Everything they say and do is just because they think it's funny. There's no malicious intent or evil with their actions. They're never like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we ruined this person's day? It's more so just... Teenagers being dumb and acting on impulse without thinking of the consequences. 
Holy cow, what are these brown chunks in here? Um, hmm. I think those are caterpillars, sir. When the boys weren't being a nuisance around town, they were hanging out in their living room, watching music videos on MTV. I thought people usually look cool in leather jackets. <laughs> Yeah, being the first MTV cartoon, I guess the network still wanted the show to have some relation to music. You know, apart from the boys wearing ACDC and Metallica shirts and making random guitar noises with their mouths. Throughout the episodes, Beavis and Butthead would watch and... review? Music videos. They'd comment on everything from the song itself, the artist or band, the absurdity of the video, basically whatever intrusive thought came into their dumb little heads. Honestly, half the time it isn't even like funny or clever even. Whoop, there's my butt. <laughs> Whoop, there's, there's my, my butt. butt. But that's what makes it feel real. Like this is exactly how me and my friends would talk to each other when we'd watch a movie or something. The show was created by Mike Judge, who'd later go on to create King of the Hill. There's even a character in Beavis and Butthead that served as a possible inspiration slash rough draft of Hank Hill. Boy, I tell you what, Dusty, I felt like a one-legged cat trying to bury turds on a frozen pond out there today. Tom Anderson is the neighbor to Beavis and Butthead. He's a simple, middle-aged Texas man that has to deal with the boy's obnoxious behavior. All the side characters in this show are so memorable. You got the health teacher, Coach Buzzcut. Do you find it amusing that we'll be talking about the testicles? <laughs> Their classmates, Stuart and Daria. Did you mean that? Or were you just jerking us around? <laughs> Daria's cool. Man, she's great. I wish she was the main character of her own TV show. You never know, National Geographic might call. Beavis and Butthead was of course filled with controversies. Nothing necessarily said or done in the show itself, but mainly parents saying that the show was a bad influence on children and made them do dangerous deeds. Beavis and Butthead were blamed for a deadly house fire said to be caused by a five-year-old boy. According to his mom, the boy used a cigarette lighter to light their mobile home on fire after watching Beavis and Butthead. Let's burn something. However, the neighbor stated that the family didn't even have cable TV and there's no way the kids could have watched the show. There were plenty of other controversies similar to this. Heck, this was the first show my parents banned me from watching. Which of course, made me even more curious to check it out. Whenever I did manage to sneak an episode or two, I didn't see what the big deal was. Sure, if the boys made an obvious toilet humor joke, I found it amusing, but I never felt like I wanted to imitate or even be Beavis or Butthead. Even as a kid, I could tell that they were losers that nobody liked. <laughs> you draw ass. Sure, it was fun to do the voices and put my shirt over my head, exclaiming, Are you threatening me? I am Cornholio! Still though, Beavis and Butthead crashed headfirst into pop culture, having seven seasons lasting from 1992 to 1997 on its initial run, as well as video games, books, special guest appearances, and a full-on movie. Beavis and Butthead do America. I watch this all the time as a kid, there are so many memorable quotes. Do you have TP? Me. TP for my bunghole? I'll get you whatever you want. The show was then revived in 2022, where I believe it's still airing new episodes today. Who would have thought that a simple show about two idiots in the 90s living their best lives would hold up and continue going strong over 30 years later? Okay, now here's a show that I've never heard of until I started working on this video. The Head. The premise of this show is already incredibly stupid. So this guy in New York named Jim wakes up one day to realize he got a big head, brain blast. Where it turns out an alien nicknamed Roy bursts out of it, and the two are like best friends and connected to each other now. Hello Jim, my name is Sietzer, you can call me Roy. Where they go on random misadventures and I think work together to take out an evil alien overlord. Maybe not, but I can kick your ass. The show is disgustingly 90s. The visuals are so rough and crude, but in a way that I honestly kind of find charming all these years later. You know, it's very classy chupo. And the voice acting is also pretty amateurish. It feels like the voice actors forgot that they're being recorded and are just having a casual conversation. As opposed to, you know, acting. Where did you get these tools? I'm in trade school. When I complete my training, the tools are mine to keep. Would you mind telling me what you're doing in my head? 
I know Jim is supposed to be a freak show with his giant head, but all the human characters in this show are equally as deformed and horrifying in their own special way. Uh, here. Oh, hey look, Beavis and Butthead. The cartoon's all over the place in a fun, chaotic way. One minute it's a slice of life, fish out of water story, and the next it's a full-on action fight between aliens. The cartoon definitely has heart, no matter how absurd things get. It never feels like the show is trying to be overly gross or shocking with anything. And without MTV, I feel like this show never would have gotten a chance on any other network in the 90s. The show ran for two seasons with a total of 21 episodes. There was even a graphic novel and cancelled Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis game. Now how you make a video game about this is something I need to see to believe. Oh my god, Madeline. I completely forgot. How am I gonna explain all this? And you! Did I remember to buy the pasta? Now surrender, hopping boy, or this charming young chippy is added to my score. You killed my hostage! Up next is definitely one of the more unique cartoons, The Max. The Max is actually a series of comic books released at the time, but if you think you're in for a fun MCU Spider-Man adventure full of colorful costumes and quirky one-liners, this probably won't be for you. Thrust his hands into boiling lava, and when they came out, they were changed and tempered by the sulfurous rock. Hmm. I like the alien story better. From what I researched about the comic itself, it's a very dark and violent world, full of unforgiving violence and evils. For example, the main villain is a serial... well, he abducts women and does things against their will. Yeah. Stylistically though, I love the art in this show. It looks like a comic book come to life. The colors, the lighting, the framing. You can pause at any point in this cartoon and it will look like a panel straight out of a comic. It's time for vengeance. Despite how I'm painting the picture of this cartoon, it does have moments of comedy, of course. Even if the humor is very dark. What you gonna do, kid? Talk me to death. What? Maybe I got a knife. The show and comic also has its fans. In the 90s, comic book movies and TV shows were viewed as for kids. I mean, the same year The Max came out, Batman Forever was in theaters. And I think you all know what you need to about that. So to stand out, a lot of comics of this nature were made to be as obviously edgy and appeal to as many young adults as possible. If you want to take a peek into what comic books and comic book cartoons needed to be in the 90s in order for people over the age of 12 to not feel embarrassed watching it, then the Max is your show. Vicious sharp fang parasites, bubble baths, journey to worlds undreamt of. With the Max, you've never seen a hero with feet this big. Man, this show scared the hell out of me when I was a kid. This is Aeon Flux, a show that, according to Wikipedia, is an American avant-garde science fiction surreal German expressionist adventure animated series. What? Sir, this is the music television network with a TV show where one of the main characters is called Butthead? <laughs> Anyway, Aeon Flux is an action anime set in a dystopian world full of robots, mutants, and women that would make me call them mommy. We follow our main heroine named Aeon Flux. She's an assassin slash spy slash soldier of fortune. She does it all. There, you'll have to scrounge up bird juice and bandages, but that should cut down the shock. The visuals are really what makes this show stand out. Everything is, like, overly animated? I'm not sure if that's the correct term, but just by looking at this, you'll kind of know what I mean. Mainly with the body movements and facial expressions. They're all so unsettling. And most of the time, I feel unintentionally. Like, there's definitely moments where they want you to feel... Well, uncomfortable at best. But other times, I feel like I'm not supposed to feel fear, but I still do. Immensely. <sighs> Once again, the cartoon is perfectly 90s, the right amount of edgy and in-your-face with the this is for adults, it's okay to watch it vibe. 
The show was made by Peter Chung, the animator who worked on The Animatrix, Rain the Conqueror, and Victor and Valentino. All of his shows have a very unique style to them. As a kid, I've never seen anything like this. A world and characters that are so psychedelic. It was both realistic and cartoony. So whenever a character would get violently mutilated or beat up in such an exaggerated way, it was so haunting for a kid to see. Aeon Flux also has a strong fan base, having a full-on live-action movie that came out in 2005, video games, graphic novels, commercial appearances, and even a reported reboot announced in 2021 set for one of the streaming services. This one adrenaline rush-filled nightmare fuel definitely created its legacy. Eon Flux Operative Terminus Alright, dang. Finally, something to bring us back down to Earth. Both figuratively and literally. Daria. Don't worry. It's a psychological test. You're automatically exempt. Yeah, remember her? That side character I mentioned earlier from Beavis and Butthead? Well, in 1997, Daria got her own spin-off show, simply named The Misanthropic Modern Views of a Suburban Teenager. What? Nah, I'm just kidding. The show's called Daria. Daria is a really fun character, mainly because she feels so real. Unlike Beavis and Butthead, who are just insane, over-the-top caricatures of teenagers, Daria actually comes off like a real teenager. She's snarky, pessimistic, and sarcastic. I don't have low self-esteem. I have low esteem for everyone else. Every line she delivers is in the most dry and not given a f attitude. It's great. It puts a frown on my face, and I don't like having a frown on my face. Maybe you could inject collagen into your lips in the shape of a smile. I think this is the show that parents shouldn't have let their kids watch, because now they know how to be a snarky Marvel one-liner spewing jerk. Field trip! Where are we going, man? The field. We follow Daria in her day-to-day -day life, dealing with all the things teenagers need to deal with. School, annoying classmates, annoying adults, friends, and family. The world around Daria is very over the top. Everyone that's not her immediate friend or family comes off as such an annoying nuisance. She's not wearing makeup. Is that a new look or something? Brr, scary. But I'm pretty sure that's the point. When you're an introverted teenager like I was, it's pretty normal to view everyone else around you as an idiot. Daria is a character that was kind of ahead of her time. Sure, the idea of a snarky know-it-all teenager character is really commonplace today, but back in the 90s, most teenagers were just written to be dumb as hell and obnoxious as humanly possible. I'll have to lock myself in my room until I die! I'll never talk to anyone for the rest of my life! Hello? Daria took a more realistic approach. She's an icon for all introverts out there who have to live in this world full of idiots. Heck, she made her debut as a side character, someone we weren't even supposed to focus on and lived in the background. Daria had five seasons, four made-for-TV specials and movies, and is still critically acclaimed to this day by fans. All hail our queen! If you watched that clip and thought to yourself, what the heck is this? Then great, mission accomplished, apparently. This is Cartoon Sushi, where during its 30 minute runtime, you'd see around 10 or so different cartoon shorts, all made by different creators and their visions. These are some of the most absurd and insane shorts I've ever seen. MTV apparently did not care what they aired as long as it didn't get them kicked off the network. The shows range anywhere from somewhat interesting... First question, who did... Uh, broccoli? Broccoli! What the frig... Fool! You dare defy broccoli! Of course I am right! To... why is this on my TV? I really love Cartoon Sushi. There aren't any shorts that I'd call bad. Every single one is chaotic in its own special way. Whether it be the art style, premise, voice acting, every short has one thing about it that'll make it stand out. And so they were cast out of the garden 
to live their lives in hell on earth. The show gave small-time animators a chance to show their vision on the big screen. In a pre-YouTube world where anyone can now see your concept for a cartoon with just a click of the mouse, back then, TV was the only real way to get a chance. There were only a few shorts that appeared in Cartoon Sushi that would eventually get turned into a full-on show. One of which being Celebrity Deathmatch that we'll be talking about shortly. Now, you may actually know the creator of Cartoon Sushi. I'll give you a hint. Listen to these end credits and see if it sounds familiar. Got an idea? Well, here's another hint. Yup, Danny Antonucci, the creator of Ed Ed Netty, manned the helm for Cartoon Sushi, having his own short be included in the show. <laughs> Yeah, it's absolutely disgusting. A lot of Antonucci's early work was, well, this, gross and edgy. He even felt so confined to the style that he created Ed Ed Netty as a personal challenge to see if he could make a children's show. Which, spoilers, yeah, he could. Where does a chicken come from? You can find a lot of Cartoon Sushi episodes on YouTube, and if you're an aspiring animator, I'd recommend checking it out. A nice showcase for all the creatives and weirdos out there. Celebrity Deathmatch is... Exactly what it sounds like. Celebrities fighting to the death. The show's presented like a pro wrestling event, with each celebrity having entrance music, cutting a promo on their opponent, and having signature finishing moves. The commentators for each episode are the fictional Johnny Gomez and Nick Diamond. They're perfectly cast for this, having that fake broadcast voice, but sounding super serious when having to commentate the ridiculous and over-the-top violence. The scary spice is putting the Louisville slugger on Little Zack! The show's done in claymation, which really works in its favor. You can get away with a lot more violence and damage done to the body in really creative ways. Mainly because the end result usually looks comedic and over-the-top. The matchups were always fun to see, too. Sometimes it was just pure nonsense and silliness, like Jim Carrey versus Mariah Carey, because both their last names are Carey. Oh, Mariah, dear! Chris Rock versus Dwayne The Rock Johnson. My neighborhood was so tough, the school paper had an obituary column. One of the most memorable feuds was Marilyn Manson versus Hanson. This was my first ever introduction to Marilyn Manson, and at the time, I only knew him as this goth weirdo who always won his fights via skeletal removal from the mouth. Brutal. And Hanson was the boy band featuring three young brothers. You know, Mbop. Don't underestimate the annoyance level of these boys. So yeah, pitting the weird heavy metal guy against the teeny boppers was the joke. You know, like if this show came out in 2008, it would definitely be Justin Bieber in that position. Apparently, the Hanson boys were upset by this, which, yeah, fair. They're 11-year-old kids seeing themselves get brutally destroyed on TV. The Hanson brothers have taken themselves out. Oh, the irony. <laughs> there were also plenty of feuds that mirrored real-life celebrity rivalries at the time. I don't know who Kristen Cavallari or Misha Barton are, but I'm sure the 90s was eating that up. The show ran from 1998 to 2007, with a video game, cancelled movie, and constant rumors of a reboot. It's such a timeless and simple concept for a show. As long as they're celebrities, there will always be a need for a deathmatch. Station Zero the show follows four teens from the Bronx that host a public access TV show, in which they watch and review hip-hop music videos. It's similar to Beavis and Butthead, just a lot less dumb. These guys would actually say something and have a bit of banter. There really wasn't much else to the show. It received low ratings and was cancelled by MTV after 21 episodes. That's about it, really. I don't have anything else to say about the show apart from... It existed.
Okay, this is Fred on your head show, a children's cartoon. You smell like a spring day. In fact, you smell like chicken. Yeah, it was made by MTV Animation, but aired on MTV sister channel, Noggin. It's a show about learning and... Pickles? Fred's jar of pickles rolled wildly. He saw things he'd never seen before. Sweet pickles. Dill pickles. Yeah, pickles seems to be the main theme here. Not really an MTV cartoon, but I just wanted to mention it. Let's move on. The last MTV cartoon to air in the 90s was a show called Downtown. How fitting, because this show is perfectly 90s. The show follows a group of diverse and multiracial friends living in downtown New York. It's a slice of life show showing the trials and tribulations that come with being a teenager and young adult. You didn't see the inside? Well, I mean, I had to grab it. This is New York. Uh. I just snatch it up. Since all of the characters come from different backgrounds, you get to see how each person struggles differently. New York is also the perfect setting. The city is always portrayed as a cesspool for crime and hard living. And you got these good-hearted characters just trying to survive. The characters all feel real. Sometimes they're on top, sometimes they hit rock bottom. As I mentioned earlier, Downtown is perfectly 90s. It's a real time capsule of a show. Everything from the clothes the characters wear, the lingo they use, and pop culture references that are made. What else can you say is completely yours besides your identity and your beeper number? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, you I like that. Heck, in 2000, Downtown was nominated for a Prime Time Emmy for Outstanding Animated Program for the episode Before and After. In this episode, we follow Gregory, a 24-year-old nerdy virgin. That's how he's literally described on Wikipedia. I'm not trying to be mean. Anyway, his friend Jen, who's another mainstay character, forces him to clean out his closet and get rid of all of his childhood toys so he can get a girl. One of these toys includes a cookie monster pillow that was made by his grandma right before she died. It's a very relatable episode. I, for one, still have a lot of my action figures and stuffed animals from my childhood, but there does come a point in everyone's life where you think, is it time to get rid of this stuff? Gregory wants to do it because he wants to get girls and feels like his toys are holding him back. But when confronted with actually getting rid of them, he can't do it. Eventually, Jen convinces him and Gregory gets very depressed, going around town regretting it trying to find that pillow. Meanwhile, Jen is kind of acting like a total bitch. Like, I guess this is just how friends were in the 90s, or in rough areas. Not really considerate to your feelings and constantly busting your balls. You know I only rip on you because my low self-esteem makes me incapable of expressing any sort of sincere emotion, right? Get out, Jen. The episode has a nice ending, though, with a girl finding the pillow and returning it to Gregory, where it turns out she also has a Sesame Street collection, and the two bond over their mutual interest. With the obvious moral of the story being, do whatever you want. The right person will like you for who you are. For a show in the 90s especially, seeing a heartwarming, sincere, and low-key cartoon meant for adults was very refreshing. Alright, this is Spy Groove. I'll be honest, I'm not impressed with this show. It's everything you think it'll be. We follow two spies with snarky attitudes, spending 80% of the episode having some epic conversations. Okay, you're right. I don't have the patience to listen to this sort of useless information. I hate to be so blunt, but I genuinely don't really have anything to say about this show. I think a big reason why it's so whatever in my eyes is the animation. Or lack thereof. Famous plan B? I'm not going to tell you. It obviously won't work or we'd be doing it. How do you know we're not doing it right now? The theme of the cartoon is spy stuff, so you'd expect there to be some action. And you'd be right, there is some action. But whenever it happens, it's so stiff and bland. Using his Zippo laser hacksaw, agent number two frees Dr. Schizoplex. A majority of the episode, like I said, just has static shots of characters talking with as little animation as possible. Apparently, though, that was the intention to be an homage to old cartoons that would utilize those techniques. So, there you go. I'm the a-hole. To be fair, the show does have funny moments and moves at a really rapid pace. It's constantly joke after joke after joke. And in something like this, it does help the show not drag on as much. Not a hunch, it's a calculated risk based on a limited amount of information. <laughs> That's a hunch. You'll call it what you like. 
For a show from the 2000s though, I do gotta give it credit for actually trying to be a show and not just chaotic nonsense for 20 minutes. Heck yeah, dude, college! Yeah, you know what it's like, beer, parties, chicks... Probably, I don't know, I never went to college. Growing up in the 2000s, this era really glorified the college experience as the best time you'll ever have in life. And with MTV primarily having that high school demographic going into college audience, it only makes sense to create a cartoon to prepare the viewers for what lies in store. Undergrads follows a group of friends who are college freshmen trying to navigate the next four years of their lives. Well, I gotta watch my mom do my laundry. You know you're in college, right? They all come from different backgrounds and have different personalities and majors, so hopefully everyone can have a character they can relate to. You know, there's the jock, the nerd, the goth girl, the idiot, and the everyman, just to name a few. Nice toss, dude. You want to join our ultimate frisbee club? Yes. Again, I never went to college, and the typical college experience never really appealed to me. You know, like the pranks and parties and all that stuff. But that's just me. I can't relate to a single thing in this show. However, if you did go to college, I could see the appeal. You can't tell a person is a virgin just by looking at them. I mean, I don't look like a virgin. Do I? The cartoon just doesn't focus on the wild and zany things that'll make a 17-year-old kid go, Whoa, yeah, dude, I can't wait. And instead, acts as a realistic portrayal of what everyone might go through. Every episode has a specific focus. Everything from roommates, financial aid, doing the hanky-panky, you know what I'm saying, the no-pants dance. You didn't get laid. You didn't even get close. Yeah, but it's a step in the right direction, and a kiss on the cheek from Kimmy Burton is worth a thousand nights in the sack with any other girl. The show's not as down-to-earth as Downtown, for example, but there's a nice balance between the crazy and the chill. One thing I love about Undergrads, though, is the soundtrack. Every episode is filled to the brim with early 2000s pop punk, the best genre of music to ever exist. Seriously, man, almost every scene just has some random pop punk playing in the background. No joke, I was constantly pausing and rewinding the episode to try and find out what song was playing. You know, so I could burn it on a CD and listen to it on my ProScan personal compact CD player. Uh, can I help you? Undergrads had a pretty short lifespan, lasting only one season with 13 episodes. In 2018, the show's creator actually got the rights back from MTV and ran a successful Kickstarter campaign for an undergrads movie to act as a series finale. Apparently, it's still being worked on and is set for a 2025 release. A series finale about college coming out 25 years later. I can't wait to see these kids dealing with issues like paying off debt and having a job not related to their degree. College in America, kids. It's a scam, but shh, you didn't hear that from me. Alright, from one of the head writers of Family Guy comes Three South. Woo! Stanford! Get your arm in the car! The show was created by Mark Henteman, who I just mentioned was a head writer on Family Guy. But in the early days, when the show was actually good. If you didn't know, Family Guy had a little hiatus slash cancellation in 2003. During this time, Mark would get the chance to create his own cartoon. It loosely follows him as the main character and his younger days in college. Hey. There really is a country called Poland. Oh, that's fun. The visuals are really crude, but I like it. The show came out in 2003, but looks straight out of the 90s. This ugly style was basically dead at this point. I don't know Mark's personal life, but if he went to college in the 90s, then it makes sense that the art style would match the history. Or maybe I'm thinking too deep into it. Your third roommate, Cal? He died last week in a freak accident! Woohoo! We talked to a dead guy! We just talked about a cartoon following kids going to college, but this one is more focused on a group of nerds and outcasts. I honestly kinda prefer this show to undergrads though, just because of how wacky it is. All the characters are ugly and weird as hell, and you can definitely see the Family Guy inspiration in some of the dialogue and jokes. Want a Thin Mint? I bought a whole box, but it turns out they're too thick for my esophagus. It makes each one a little death cookie! 
I really recommend this cartoon and wish it had more episodes. By the end, I was like, oh, that's it? 3 South ran for one season and 13 episodes, with three of them never even making it onto TV. Once Family Guy was once again airing new episodes, Mark would go back to work on the show. I think, at least. I don't plan on stalking the guy. You should be an ass doctor. They make a lot of money because they gotta touch people's asses. Oh, God. Aha, uh -huh, yeah! Spider-Man! Can't run away from me forever, Peter Parker. Oh, no! Spider-Man! In 2003, MTV created Spider-Man The New Animated Series, not to be confused with Spider-Man The Animated Series, the show that I loved as a kid. This is probably the best Spider-Man cartoon to exist. But how does the new animated series hold up? Well, visually, not that great at all. I'm not sure why they opted for this ugly PS1 CGI. Like, there's no way this was cheaper than doing anything else. Hey, anyone see a crook? About 6'1", moves fast, looks like a driver for the space shuttle? Who do you think we are? It's not even, like, kinda noticeable with how bad it is. It's really hard to focus on anything else apart from the visuals. What's the story? What's going on? Who's that? You don't know, you're just looking at this game wondering when it's gonna finish loading. Here you are, saving me again. Oh, man's gotta have hobbies. Visuals aside, this show is alright. It doesn't really bring anything new to the table. Like being on MTV, you'd think the show might be a little more mature. Maybe some light swearing, a little bit of nudity. I mean, come on, Aunt May, I know you gotta be hot in this universe too. But there really isn't anything that makes this stand out when compared to, again, the animated series. The only thing that's more mature with the new animated series is that it really drags on. Characters will just talk and talk, usually about nothing. Hey, I'll videotape the lecture for you so you won't miss anything. That would be great. Leave it to you to know exactly what I'm thinking. What is interesting to note, though, is that this series was actually meant to act as a sequel to the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. Yeah, the one that came out in 2002. Making this show technically canon to the three Sam Raimi movies. However, by the time Spider-Man 2 came out, they obviously didn't take into account any events in the new animated series. And instead, this cartoon just became an alternate branching timeline to the first movie. Being Spider-Man, the show of course received pretty high ratings, but was ultimately cancelled by MTV after just one season, saying that the show didn't really fit in with their other programming. I get it, Spider-Man is popular, but not super duper mainstream popular like he is now. If a dumb college kid was just watching Beavis and Butthead in their dorm room and out of nowhere a Spider-Man cartoon came up, they'd probably change the channel since they didn't want to look like a little kid. And you can stop glorifying that murdering freak boy Spider-Man. But I like taking news photos. Besides, not everyone hates Spider-Man. Despite not being my favorite Spider-Man cartoon, it still does hold a nostalgic place in my heart. There was a different vibe to this show, more subdued and having a focus on Peter more than Spider-Man. Because with great power comes Neil Patrick Harris as Spider-Man. Clone High. Now, you Gen Z kids on TikTok probably know all about this show for some reason because it was brought back into the mainstream. I invaded her bay of pigs, if you catch my meaning. The show's a comedy following teenage clones of historical figures. You got young Gandhi, Abe Lincoln, Joan of Arc, Cleopatra, and JFK. Then, hilarity ensues. What you doing in here, buddy? Making a Lincoln log? Hey -o! I'll be honest. I think this is like a hot take, but I'm sorry, I don't like this show. I don't hate it or anything, I just think it's... Would you tell a sunset that it couldn't last forever? Sunsets last six minutes. I know I'm in the minority here, but I don't care about these characters. They're all clones of historical figures, but it never really plays into anything. Abe Lincoln has a crush on Cleopatra. Why? What's the reference? What's the relation? These two characters might as well be Jerry Seinfeld and Sailor Moon. Like, there's not a lot of well-known information about these two that would make seeing teenage version of themselves funny. Occasionally they do it, like JFK being a cocky ladies' man because JFK in real life was a handsome young president, I guess. She's numbers one and two on my list of 150 women to bang this year! 
and Gandhi being the annoying comedy relief because in real life he wasn't exactly the nicest of guys. Ten dudes with matching white tuxes, tennis shoes for attitude, and we leave with a hundred ladies! I feel bad because out of all of the MTV cartoons, this is the one that I think has the strongest fan base today. On the show's initial run, it only had one season with 13 episodes. The show got a revival and a second season in 2023. So I'm not trying to crap on the show or say it's bad, it's just not for me personally. There are some good jokes and moments I liked, of course. Joan of Arc, up top! Don't touch me, Gandhi. Too slow! So there you go. We can end this segment on a positive. All right, welcome to YouTube 2006. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I misread that. I meant welcome to video mods. I don't even know if you can consider this a cartoon or a TV show even. What you're seeing is an animated music video using video game characters. And that's it. It's just like, who is this for? Who's dying to see SpongeBob put on a Blink-182 concert? Okay, bad example, everyone wants to see that, but you see my point, right? It's not like they were covers or the music videos were animated to be exciting to watch. It's literally just people playing with video game assets and making them bounce around like Guitar Hero mods. Ah, who am I kidding? This is great. It's like watching a machinima before they really picked up in popularity a few years later on YouTube. Ah, yeah. The 2000s music really is the secret sauce here. Using any other era of music really wouldn't do the videos justice. The stars just happen to align with this era of music and cringy ideas. What's funny is that apparently MTV2 never even gave the green light for this stuff to air. The head programming director of MTV2, spin-off channel, were eventually forced off the air. Making these video mods kind of lost media for a while. Until they were all unofficially uploaded on YouTube in 2022. Thank you, 2000s, for just being the worst. You remember how nice it was watching children's shows like Sesame Street and Barney when you were a kid? Well, what if they made it for adults? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, hey, what does that even mean? Well, I'm not too sure myself, but that's kind of the charm. Oh yeah, I got some letters for you. F you, bitch. Wonder shows in. You got everything from cartoons, puppets, and live action stuff. Cuddles and Crunch were the boogie noogie buds. Shuggy. 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 Full of things that might look educational on the surface, but when you actually watch this stuff... If we all join hands and visualize a big hug in the sky... Shut up, Hibby! You stay! Go take a shower! <laughs> no. Far from it. That's basically the entire show. Tons of silly skits with quotable nonsense. I like it. I'm always curious as to the creative process of something like this. Like, what kind of upbringing did you need to have to write these ideas? Who cares? I'm going to Cabo. Woo! I hate myself. I hate myself. I hate myself. That's all I gotta say. Wonder Shows is something that's better watched than explained. So, watch this. Citizens, rise up! Rise up! Wanna go fight the power with me later? Fight the power with you later? <laughs> the power. We're fighting. We're fighting a China power. If you're into weird skits that'll get you some weird looks from people, then here you go. Where are my dogs at? Or since this is the mid 2000s. God, again, what a terrible time. I love it. The show follows two dogs from the hood, Buddy and Wolf, who ran away from their owners and ended up in Hollywood. With the main premise of the show having the dogs being adopted or taken care of by different celebrities. She used to be on a simple life and heroin. Yeah, she made Paris Hilton look smart. The celebrities are of course never shown in a super great light. The dogs get adopted by Angelina Jolie and Lindsay Lohan, who are shown to be anorexic bimbos. You got Steve-O, who's shown to be a brainless, you know, jackass. <laughs> Let's roll! And hey, with a show about dogs, what celebrity was bound to show up? 
I need a Snoop Doggish dog, Doug, dig? Yep, the big dog himself, Snoop D-O-double-G. The show's okay, I guess. MTV really liked picking on celebrities, and as a kid, I definitely didn't know enough to know what was going on. All of the celebrities have the same gimmick of being annoying and over the top. I hear she cries at a drop of a hat. <laughs> like, I've never met Jennifer Aniston, but according to this show, she's someone who's constantly breaking down and crying over everything. Not the greatest cartoon. It lasted from June 2006 to July 2006. A whole month. Who let the dogs out, indeed? Alright, time for the lightning round. These are shows that I honestly don't have much to say for one reason or another. Okay, so really quickly though, in the 90s, Nickelodeon had this show called Ran and Stimpy. It was one of the first idiot duo cartoons and teens and kids quickly fell in love with it. It was eventually cancelled in 1995, but in 2003 it had a revival and rebranding. Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon. I'm not afraid of you! Get him, Jesus! Hey, you guys wanna watch me take a dump? Yes! It's one of the stupidest things I've ever seen in my life. It's just so over the top with the sexual humor that maybe if you were 13 you could point and laugh because haha <laughs> boobs. But honestly, it's just garbage. Now the reason I'm not spending too much time on this show is because I could have sworn it was MTV that created and aired this revival, but no, it was actually Spike TV. However, Adult Party Cartoon did air on MTV in Poland. So technically I didn't lie. This is the adventures of Chico and Guapo. He come by, he tried to get close to me and touch my chucho, lick my toto. That's it, that's the entire show. I have nothing else to say. It's just that for 30 minutes. Literally looks like it was made in Go Animate. DJ and the Fro. It's a wannabe home movies with Beavis and Butthead commentary over internet clips instead of music videos. No matter how you come with me, and you and you down doing what I'm talking about doing, lawyers can get this book open. Yeah! yeah! I give a f what you think, bitch! This guy been had Jesus! Once again, yep, it's not funny. Friday the Animated Series is an animated series based off the movie Friday. Hopefully I didn't blow your mind too much there. Bird just landed on you. Yeah, I know. And it sucks. Anything that's not the original Friday movie and tries to replicate the charm is always so bad. First off, visually, it's just lazy once again and unappealing. The stiff Go Animate look is very present. And what's the point of having these characters if you don't have Ice Cube, Chris Tucker, John Witherspoon, and everyone who made that movie and these characters great? There's a massive difference of this. Thumbs up means tell up. Thumbs down means channel down. Damn, that old man's got a set of pipes. Shall we get our day started? We shall. And this. Every time I come in the kitchen, you in the kitchen. In the goddamn refrigerator. But I'm gonna get you high today. Cause it's Friday, you ain't got no job, and you ain't got shit to do. Good Vibes. It's an unfunny adult cartoon that came out in the 2010s. You name it, Brickleberry, Border Town, stilted unfunny crap. Thank you, MTV. I wasn't gonna tell you, but last night I had a dream that involved a bottle of lavender body butter, the backseat of a purple PT Cruiser, and Gina's downstairs area. Very cool. Yeah, as you can see, MTV cartoons really started to degrade in quality as time went on. The 90s was obviously the golden years. At a time of counterculture, MTV managed to strike gold with shows starring outcasts and rebels, all with different personalities that everyone could relate to in one way or another. Despite the less than stellar cartoons under the MTV umbrella now, they have been reviving some of their older properties and giving them more stories. More Beavis and Butthead, Daria, Clone High sequels, so forth and so on. Watching these cartoons really did feel like a blast from the past. Jumping into a time of grunge and counterculture. Dumb characters, inappropriate content for kids, scaring your parents with what the youth was being raised on. It's awesome. So if there's one thing to take away from this, it's that pop punk still rules all, I think. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on MTV. Where there will be no more music in sight. See ya.